starting in about one. We'll be starting in about one minute. All right, let me see if we've got the full complement of our policy roundtable folks with us. If I could ask the CTAF panel themselves to please go off camera just so it minimizes the number of screens. Um, so Joanna, if you don't mind going off camera, Annette, thank you. Um, but I'm looking, let's see, I'm waiting for our clinical experts to return. And Biogen folks, so we'll hopefully get them on board very quickly. Steve, I'm here. This is Chris. Oh, there you are. Sorry, you weren't showing up in my uh, in my screen there. Okay, I'll try to make sure I'm seeing everybody. All right. So I am going. To, there we go. And I see Dr. Henderson. Great. Okay. Sorry. Let me just one more try to get this. Okay, that's not what we wanted. Okay, there we go, finally. All right, folks, welcome back. And we're gonna start the policy round table now. Um, thank you again. I wanna introduce um, the folks who are on the policy round table. And we have um, Dr. Henderson and Dr. Kremen, who've been with us from the beginning, as well as uh, Matthew Baumgart and Laura Jones. And I wanna introduce a few other people. Let me go ahead and turn to the slide that shows everybody. There we go. So again, Matthew Baumgart, um, we've got Leslie Fish. Leslie, hi, why don't you introduce yourself? Oops, you're on mute though. Hi there, unmuted. Um, hi, I'm Leslie Fish, I'm from IPD analytics, um, and we consult with uh, various um, payers in the United States and um, other subscribers well, on pharmaceuticals. Yes. And I think we have somebody on another phone. Yeah, Grace. <laughs> thank you, Grace. Thanks. All right. So did you, Leslie, I think you finished, right? So yeah, you're. Yeah. yeah. Right, and Leslie. no conflict and no conflict of interest, Stephen. Okay. Thanks. Um, and Pat Gleason. Why don't you introduce yourself? Yes, hello. Pleasure to be here. Uh, I do have a conflict of interest. Uh, I work for Prime Therapeutics, a pharmacy benefit manager. I'm um, an assistant vice president there of health outcomes. Um, Prime Therapeutics, uh, we partner with 19 Blue Cross Blue Shield plans, our owner plans, uh, and provide pharmacy benefits for 33 million Americans through our relationship with our health plans, employers, and government programs, including Medicaid and Medicare. I'm also an adjunct professor of pharmacy at the University of Minnesota. Pleasure to be here, thanks. Thank you, Pat, nice to have you with us. Um, Chris, you have been with us uh, for the morning, so welcome back to the Policy Roundtable. Um, Mark McClellan will be just a few minutes late. I'm not sure exactly what time he's able to join. It may be about 15 minutes from now. So I've told him that I will direct the kind of questions around uh, kind of federal policy uh, to the time when he's able to join us. But um, just to, to skip to the chase, as many of you know, he's the director of the Duke University Margolis Center for Health Policy and former chief both of the FDA and of CMS. Um, and so we'll bring a variety of different uh, perspectives and experience with him when he's able to arrive. Okay, so we have an hour and 45 minutes. We have way too much to cover and yet it's all important. And I've broken it down into about six buckets. And that means we have about 15 minutes for each of these. I'm, I'll try to be thoughtful and get as many perspectives on this as possible as we go through. 
Um, I've already mentioned to the audience, you know, we're going to start with the kind of patient doctor perspective, move through pricing into the coverage policy arena of issues, <clears throat> and then kind of round up towards the end around the research aspects of the confirmatory trial and the other kind of broader research landscape policy issues for uh, new treatments, emerging treatments for Alzheimer's disease. Um, I think we all know that we could spend this entire policy roundtable talking about the FDA and about what happened over the past two years. Um, some of that may come up, but I really kind of, I think we're going to be looking forward um, primarily. And to that extent, I kind of wanted to start with, again, with the clinical experts and, and Matthew, perhaps, um, how, let's talk briefly about the best approaches we can recommend for how patients and doctors are, and families are going to be talking about aducanumab, what it means as a potential treatment, um, what's the uptake going to be like? How are we going to see this start to kind of emerge across the country? What little data we have so far, and it's little, we have some surveys of neurologists that have been done by Wall Street firms saying that there's a strong interest in prescribing Adjuhelm, at least among some community neurologists. We've had some large delivery systems, though, just this week to announce that they are not going to be uh, using Adjuhelm including the Cleveland Clinic, Mount Sinai. Um, we just heard a fairly strong statement from the American Academy of Neurology. American Geriatric Society has come out against, um, certainly against approval. So it's gonna be a mixed picture. And I'm just wondering from the clinical expert and, and Matthew, maybe you can speak to this too. What's gonna be our best practice in helping patients and families understand what this means for them? How, how do we go about this as a system? And Chris, I know you, you, you can certainly chime in too, but let me start with clinical experts. You'll be having, you've already had patients or families, I'm sure, um, ask about this. How, how are you approaching it? Sarah, what are you doing? Uh, yes, in fact, I just had this conversation again on Monday. <laughs> so with the exact question of, can I take my loved one off of the blood thinner so that I could go on this medication? So it's exactly as was just described <laughs> previously. Interesting. Um, so, you know, I think it's going to take a lot of work first on the part of the clinician to really understand exactly what we've been talking about today in terms of what were the conditions that the, of the trial and what kind of patients were included in that trial and what kind of patients were not included in that trial. Um, in any trial, it doesn't matter, you know, what kind of trial, typically in an Alzheimer's trial, we're trying to get the, you know, the, the uh, how, how do I put it? The kinds of patients that are in there, you don't, you're not going to allow people, say, with lots of vascular disease on their MRI. You're not going to have people with, you know, diabetes or other other kinds of medical conditions that sort of muddy what you're looking at in terms of a, a research outcome. But when you're trying to apply that in the real world, it's, it makes it a lot harder. And so I think that it's going to take a lot of work upon for the clinicians to understand who was in the trial, who wasn't in the trial. How does that match up with the person and the family sitting in front of me? Uh, and also in terms of, you know, what is the cognitive score, say an MMSE, we do have that, that we can hang our hat on. So what is the MMSE of the patient sitting in front of us? We probably won't be doing a CDR on everybody since that's usually done in research. Most mm -hmm. clinical neurologists won't be doing that either. So how are you going to make a determination of, um, you know, what their level of um, functionality is. And then uh, explaining to, you know, the families, what did the study show and what didn't it show? So yes, it showed that we could clear amyloid, but what do we know about that relationship to cognitive and functional benefit and going through certainly the risks and the benefits, if any. Yeah. And Matthew, you must, I mean, I know you're not on the clinical side, um, as you said, but I know at the Alzheimer's Association, so many families are going to be coming to your website looking for information. How are you taking this challenge on board to frame the evidence for patients and, and families? Um, you could always say, talk to your doctor, uh, full stop. But what are you, how are you trying to sort this out on your end? Yeah, I, I, I think um, uh, uh, you, you hit the first sentence out out of our mouths is talk talk to our doc talk to your doctor have that conversation with your doctor but i but i do think sarah makes a very good point there needs to be a lot of education of of physicians here this 
this drug is, despite the fact that, you know, we supported um, the FDA approval, we support coverage of this drug, it's not for everybody. It's not going to work in everybody. Um, there is a, there was the clinical trial population was, was a certain group, you know, was a certain group of people. Um, this is not right for even though people have started to say it, um, you know, people who might be at risk because I had three family members and they have no cognitive problems. And I know, you know, they've already started asking about the drug and, and, that, and it's not appropriate. Um, um, it was, you know, the clinical trial population did not include moderate and severe, and this shouldn't be given there. And so I think there's a lot of um, education to be had with physicians. I think um, one of the important things that I think it's, that I think everybody needs to understand, and that's clinicians and 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 by extension, patients, is that with this drug, probably with the next series of drugs that are going to come along, cognition is not going to get better; it's just going to get less worse. And I think that's a very important um, point to set expectation levels. Of, of patients and families, um, you're, you're, you're not going to, this isn't going to reverse course for you. This is just going to, to make things less worse. And that's, and that's part, and that's a difficult thing to do because it's hard to show if, if you're using the MMSE, you know, did I drop one point instead of two points, right? And and it, it, and that's hard to show because you're not going to show a gain of point, right? You're you're not going to show the points in the other direction. So I think that I think it's important to set set those kind of expectations and that kind of understanding um, um, as well. Um, and I won't let me break in on that point. Yeah, yeah. To me, that's that, that is one of the most one of the really important early things to talk about for for policymakers, like the Alzheimer's Association. Um, by the way, I really regret that we can't do this roundtable in person because I, I kind of walk in and around you all and I make you, feel, <laughs> I make you feel comfortable before I ask you a really tough question. And so today it's just going to feel like it's coming straight at you. <laughs> so Matt, you're first up for the tough question, okay? There will be other tough questions. Everybody's going to get them. Um, Matt, your CEO was quoted um, as saying the successful trial, and there was a successful trial, showed 22% improvement in what is effectively the cognitive functional side of people's lives. So there's that language problem where I'm concerned as a doctor myself, I know how hard it is for patients to understand a slowing of decline. But if we, if we policy leaders like your CEO get out there and talk about improvement, I think we've got a big problem. And Chris, you're taking a drink of water and you might as well tee yourself up for some tough questions too. But Maha herself was quoted today in the press as saying, what Adjuhelm offers hopefully is a hope to really be able to integrate these patients back into society, give them back a quality of life. That sounds like people getting better to me, like taking my mother or somebody else who's bad and making them better. How do we, how do we avoid that kind of messaging, even though it's the early weeks, I feel like we're already missing some of those opportunities to frame this correctly. So I don't know, Matt, do you have anything in general to say about how you guys are trying to, to, to manage this? So I do, I, you know, I, I don't, you and I may, may hear that framing differently, I think, Steve. Um, I'm, I, it is to an individual patient Having that additional three, four, five, six months, one, two years even, um, is, is an improvement. It does give them more of their life back relative to what would have happened um, and what would happen without, without the drug. Um, I just think it's, it's an important um, line to walk um, and, um, and, and setting those expectations. But from a patient perspective, getting that extra time is an improvement. Um, it's not an improvement in a clinical score. Um, and I think there is a difference. And I think sometimes we get caught up in, and this is, this is you know, kind of some of my issues with, with, with some of the clinical trials and the data that's collected. I think we do need to collect additional type of, you know, uh, patient outcome kind of data, not just clinical score data, um, which would help with um, 
some of the value assessment issues that I that I have. Um, but but I think it is um, it is an improvement in what would have happened. And it does give them some of their life back if they're able to maintain um, maintain relationships for six more months, a year, um, two years. OK, I think I'm hearing what you're saying. I, I think it's fair to to worry a little bit that words like improvement, like giving people their life back, suggest to some ears, uh, at least to the patients that I work with have worked with, that would make them feel like things could get better instead of just slowing the decline. I hear what you're saying about more time at home being better than it would have been, and that's an improvement. Um, but I, I'm just sensitive to how physicians, it's gonna be really, really tricky for all of the communicators out there. And again, Alzheimer's Association being so important here to, I think, be very cautious in how some of this is framed. Chris, did you have any perspective on the way? Because you guys obviously can't market outside the label. I heard Maha's comment as being pretty close to saying it makes you better. Well, let's be clear. I mean, since the, the time of approval, um, you know, we've been very clear with regards to who the patients are who we want to be on this treatment first. And it's clearly in line with the patients we've studied. These are MCI due to AD, mild due to AD patients. And when I say due to AD, we say with A beta confirmation. And, you know, to me, it's in no one's interest here to have patients who um, don't have the underlying pathology of the disease receiving this based on the data we have to date. And so we've been very clear on that from day one. We were pleased with the changes to the labeling a week ago. Um, and I think that will also help. I have to say, um, you know, we knew this is going to be, as it is in any area, when you haven't had a new treatment in 20 years, when you have a transformational uh, first biologic in a category, this creates all sorts of potential, um, you know, challenges with regards to helping people understand. And I have to say in the first, you know, what, five weeks now, we've been encouraged by the fact that many physicians recognize this is not for everyone. And also patients are recognizing this isn't a silver bullet. Um, this is a first treatment. It's a first of its kind, um, but there needs to be more to come. So I have to say there's a tremendous amount of education that's required here. All of us on this call certainly play a very important role in that. And, you know, I'm encouraged on the direction ahead, but it's, this will be a journey, certainly when you have a first of its kind treatment coming in um, after a long history like this. All right, thanks. So let's talk in terms of the, the patient aspects too, or the, I guess this is more of a kind of a system effect, but, you know, we are, as you heard earlier, people are concerned that the introduction of this treatment, um, well, people are mixed. If they feel like it doesn't work, then they're not too worried if only rich white people get it. Um, but they see a pattern in our, in our health system and it's not Biogen's fault. It's not, you know, anybody's fault to a certain extent. It's our collective issue of trying to figure out how we get new treatments into communities that have often not received fair access to new effective care. Again, Biogen, I know you have thought about this. Um, I'll let you talk about what proactive things you're going to, to work on, but I can't not ask you about the lack of diversity in the clinical trials that you put together um, out of 3,268 patients. In your pivotal trials, 19 self-identified as black. That's a 0.6%. So somebody just missed the ball on that one. Now you can tell us why it's impossible to get more black patients into these clinical trials here in the United States, but help us understand that and then project for us how you think, at least for aducanumab and hopefully for other future treatments, we can do a better job of, of equalizing access. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, no, this is a, you know, as, as I think ICER has done a fantastic job in this consideration of really trying to elevate this topic in this meeting, because we're frustrated, like everyone, with regards to clinical trials. And this isn't unique to Edge of Helm. It's not unique to um, even Alzheimer's. As we know, it, as an entire research enterprise or research industry, um, there's been a long history of struggling to get better representation from underrepresented groups. And I think universally, you know, the research community has seen this as a priority and we've pushed for this. Um, I, you know, I was just learning even yesterday about some of the national studies recently in Alzheimer's where they have characteristics, unfortunately, very similar to things that we saw in our engage and merge results. So to us, this is a really frustrating aspect, something that we're in really seriously. 
we've committed very publicly um, to ensure that as we go forward, we're taking active efforts to ensure that there are better representation. We've established a, a clinical trial advisory group representing uh, Black, uh, African-American, Latinx members to help guide our clinical trial recruitment efforts. That's not just exclusive to Alzheimer's, but across all of our uh, neuroscience programs, um, which I hope will um, you know, help in advancing this area because clearly this is a real challenge. But I do want to spell, uh, speak beyond the clinical trials to we recognized early on, and it's not just about treatment. I know, and I appreciate Steve, you highlighting this is, you know, it's not just about certainly an, an Alzheimer's treatment, but it is also um, a, can, an issue in Alzheimer's. Um, we know that, as I said, that black uh, African-American Latinx uh, uh, individuals are disproportionately more likely to develop Alzheimer's. They're more likely to have missed diagnoses. And so while I know some of the discussion here will focus on treatment, um, and equity issues when it comes to insurance and, and treatment, we don't want to forget the fact that they are also misrepresented when they don't get diagnosed, when the symptom awareness recognition gets missed. We have long lag times and delays. And so recognizing that well in advance of approval, we started working on programs here. And you've seen our announcements around um, our partnerships with CVS Health, mm -hmm. National Association of Free and Charitable Clinics. Um, and these involve a network of clinics across the country that um, provide appropriate information about the disease, about cognitive screening, which we hope will go more to the root cause long before you get into a situation for even some who may ultimately be good candidates for Alzheimer's treatments. That's great. I, Steve, I, want, to, I want to circle back. Oh, sorry, Matt, go ahead. Uh, could I, since this, is, since this is a policy discussion, I did want to mention one item of public policy here. On this, on this front, there is a bill that's been introduced in Congress called the ENACT Act. Um, do, it's an acronym, and like everything else, and so, and I'm not going to be able to tell you what the acronym is, um, but it is, it is aimed at increasing diversity in Alzheimer's clinical trials. Um, it provides funds to um, the NIA to increase the diversity of clinical trial research staff, which is part of the problem, to do additional outreach and to increase um, uh, increase the amount of uh, the number of clinical trials that happen in areas of high concentrations of underrepresented populations. So I would just wanted to mention that since there's a policy roundtable, there is a public policy bill before Congress. Thank you. Um, so I'll come back to a quick question to you, uh, Chris, about this also. But from the clinician expert perspective, do you well, guys see before, before that, um, can I yeah. break in and say there's been a raised hand for about five minutes? Oh, Laura, I'm so sorry. I didn't see it, but now I see it. Please. Thanks. I do have some comments. Um, my first comment is about education. I think that there would be a serious value to having some caregiver to caregiver education. Number one, caregivers don't trust their doctors. They really, in many cases, don't know what they're talking about. I personally would not risk not engaging on a major uh, learning um, uh, effort about this job if my husband was still alive and I was looking at it. Um, I, like I said, I would wanna to listen to other caregivers. I would wanna hear what their opinions are. I think that other caregivers would be able to caution um, the, the caregiver and the patient about whether or not this was appropriate for them. There needs to be a feeling that the people who are speaking to you are from within the same trench as you are. This is something that I found to be a, extremely effective in my group that I run. We, um, we I, I see it as a circle. When you first come in and you're the new person in the group, you don't know anything. You look at the next person in line for your advice. You don't look at the top of the line, the person who's been there the longest. It's unreasonable to you. You don't believe it. You know the guy next in line to you. He's in the trenches with you and he has some opinions that might be of value to you. I, I think that's important. I can also tell you from personal experience, I'm white, I'm a woman, I'm somewhat privileged. I'm, I'm able to earn a good living when after I got back to work after my two heart attacks. Um, I could not put my husband in a drug trial because I had to work to support my family. He was taken out of the workforce. I had a kid, I had a husband I had to take care of. I had to get back into the workforce. I had to make a lot of money. So I did not have time to be home and pay attention to him and monitor his 
side effects, number one. I couldn't do the documentation for the trial. We wanted to be in the trial. I didn't even have the ability to get him to the doctor's appointments. In the beginning, he might have been able to, Tim, we talked about this uh, eight years ago when I was at Biogen working on the trial retention um, with the trial retention group. Even in the beginning of the disease, he would have been able to take an Uber or a cab to, to the doctor's appointments. But you know, you get a year or two into this, like you can't send somebody in a cab by themselves. So to stay in a trial for me had nothing to do with my color or like, I mean, nothing. Literally, I couldn't do it. I couldn't get in there. Like, I don't know why people think it's because you're, you're, you're from a disadvantaged group. It's hard work to put someone in a trial and it takes a lot of time. People who are new caregivers to Alzheimer's, they don't have that. They're overwhelmed with their daily life. I didn't have hours a day to think about what was going on with him. I'm sorry, that's, you, you can take it from there. <laughs> no, that's, that's a great perspective to share. And I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand up earlier. I, I do apologize for that. And to be obvious, there are no people of color on this uh, policy roundtable. So we're, we're talking about something that we all acknowledge we need to take some, some steps to, to address. Um, Chris, I, actually, I'm going to just assume that we can come up with a general policy statement that the clinical specialties out there need to up their game because whether it's aducanumab or another treatment, hopefully soon there'll be others, um, there will be an opportunity to do better as we introduce new treatments um, for Alzheimer's and other neurologic conditions. And so the specialty societies can think about ways to educate themselves and educate their patients and families in a way that hopefully can um, improve the ability of, of families from all over you know, the country, different walks of life to be able to get equal access to these treatments. Chris, for you in particular though, I'm assuming it costs more money to spend extra time to try to enrich a, a, you know, a study population with people from underserved communities. Why doesn't the FDA just say you, have, you can't come to us with pivotal trials that aren't representative of the population mix in the United States? Could the FDA just do that? Yeah, so what I would say is, you know, we don't look at these kinds of items as costs as far as making the trial more enriched and better. And obviously with the questions that continue to surface and the importance of this, this is a huge priority for us. And, um, you know, I'd be delighted if in your report, it comes out with a statement to the effect that we need to continue to improve this. Um, I think that'd be a very good thing to come out. And, and you heard from Matthew already, as well as, you know, certainly the entire pharmaceutical industry and the research uh, uh, areas that this is a huge priority. Um, I won't speak to the FDA. Um, maybe Mark would be better to, to speak to some of those items. I won't speak to sure. anything related to that, but thanks. Okay. All right. Let me watch the clock because I've got to do that throughout. And I think I'm going to shift to talk about uh, price um, and the cost and, and issues around that before we get to, um, and I think I'm, I actually have a couple slides to show in just a second, then I can go off this shared screen like this. Um, just a couple of, of, I guess you could call them facts or perspectives from prior work. So if we start with the patient perspective here, the 20, and let's assume that it's a Medicare patient to start with, the 20% coinsurance is $11,300 per year. Um, that is 40% of the median annual income of senior citizens in the United States. So just to start there, and we know that most Americans on Medicare do have supplemental insurance, but 6 million don't. And so, and we can probably guess that those 6 million are more likely to be poor Americans who will have even less ability to pay for this out of their own pocket. And even those who do have supplemental insurance, it's estimated at least that their premiums will grow significantly if the use of this treatment obviously kicks in and supplemental insurance is used to pay for it. Um, on the other hand, 20 million Americans have Medicare Advantage and they don't have um, supplemental insurance, um, most of them, and they actually also have to pay 20% or higher coinsurance on Part B type drugs. Um, they do have an out-of-pocket max, but it's 7,550 per year. So, that's, that's just from my perspective, at least the patient kind of out of pocket experience and also a little bit on the Medicare premium side that could be a concern. Um, then I have just a couple of other slides and this is to, to tee us up, see if I get this right. Okay, this is um, with uh, uh, permission from STAT, which is a, an online newsletter in the kind of pharmaceutical space. 
So they put out um, a kind of a graph in an article that says, these are the doctor administered drugs that Medicare spends the most on um, each year in the, night in the United States. And Adjahelm is displayed up front, obviously is hypothetical in terms of its cost impact. And below it, you see the other drugs, Ilea, Keytruda, Optivo, Rituxan, and Prolia. Those are the top five current spending drugs of drugs that are administered by doctors. So what you see in the top bar is obviously estimates for what Adjuhelm could cost. My slides aren't showing. I'm so sorry. It says I am screen sharing, but my slides aren't. Okay. It's showing. I can see it. Pardon me? We see it. I can see it. I you can see it. Okay. I just had somebody pop in and saying that nobody could see my slides, but maybe that was just for a second. Okay. But okay. Because you can see that. You can see. Okay. And I'm also told that Mark McClellan has joined us. And even though I can't see that with my wonderful set. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hello, Mark. We're going to come back to you. I talked, I just asked a question about the FDA. I can come back to it in a second. I moved on to cost, uh, pricing cost. So this comes again from, uh, sorry, let me go back to this. So you see three estimates here. You see a KFF, that's the Kaiser Family Foundation estimate. They did kind of a rough estimate of a certain percent of a certain eligible pool. Um, they, others have highlighted Biogen and its own uh, investor call said low estimate. Now this was not their own estimate for what they think will happen, but they told the investor community, here's the opportunity. Um, and it would run between 57, if you will, to 115 billion at peak sales. So just for, that's some perspective. Um, interestingly, the Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's Association at the meeting that Chris and I were at yesterday, their own estimate is very close to the Kaiser estimate. It's 28 billion. They said they think 500,000 patients in America will use it at $56,000 a year. That's exactly $28 billion. So just as to kind of explore something, this is at the $56,000 uh, per year annual price. If you go with that Kaiser Family Foundation estimate, which is also the Alzheimer's Association estimate, and we just imagined this hypothetical world in which Adrian was priced at 5,600 instead of 56,000. It would still tie for the top cost drug in the Medicare Part B system. And if you use the Biogen low estimate, it would be almost twice as much as the next spend drug. And at the high end, obviously much further downstream. So, that's, and I, you know, I could pull, I've got documents here that have quotes from other kind of Wall Street investment groups, Evercore, RBC Capital, Cohen. They're all in the 25 to 35 billion uh, per year uh, range. Um, one last piece of, of context, the entire budget of the NIH is 43 billion each year. The entire amount of that spent on Alzheimer's research in the country is 3.2 billion each year. So that's just to put things in context. And Matthew, I'll turn to you first, and I'm gonna stop sharing now because I think I can, we don't need to see anything more. All right, Matthew, um, I know that the Alzheimer's Association came out very quickly um, and people noted that it was not very common to see a leading patient group do so, saying that the price was quote, simply unacceptable, end quote. And you said Biogen should change this price. Can you say more about that? Why did you guys think it was simply unacceptable? Did you have a, what price were you thinking would not have led you to make that claim? And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what the throughput's going to be, but how, how and why did, you're on the policy side, so I'm sure you were involved. How did you come out with that? Why with that statement and in a sense, give us some context for that. What price would not have been unacceptable? So I don't know. I, I, we didn't have conversations about what price would or would would have been acceptable. Our issue was, um, does what does this price do to access? And the price was at a level where we believed that it was going to hinder the ability of, of um, plans to pay for it people to cover their out-of-pocket costs, and it was going to hinder access to those who could benefit from this drug from getting access to the drug. 
Um, you know, I, I, I'm not going to sit around and say we did, a, you know, we sat there and did, a, you know, we built a, um, uh, we didn't have your team to build us a model. Um, so, um, uh, you know, we didn't have, a, but, but when we looked at what the price was, what the cost would be to individuals, what the cost would be to plans, um, we concluded that um, um, what would be, um, what patients would be forced to pay and what plans would be forced to pay or plans deciding not to pay at all um, would dramatically um, hinder um, access to the drug. All right. So I assume that this, you've never done this kind of statement before about the price of a drug. Well, we, we've never we had a drug. We haven't had the opportunity, I guess. And that's, yes, part of, yes in a sense. And so you may not have any sense of where the throughput is, but, and I'm sure this isn't your favorite article, but there's, you know, there are, there are some articles out there already wondering whether the Alzheimer's Association statement really has teeth, whether they're willing to stand behind it or do anything more than put out a single statement. Um, I did go to the website today and I couldn't find it. Um, I had to Google it separately. It's not on that main page that patients go to and families when you click on, tell me more about Adjuhelm. There's nothing about the price. So what do you view on the policy side? Are you guys going to ask patients and families to call their congressman or or do, you know, is there any kind of next step that you would envision here? Well, it was not just a one-off statement. I've said it about four times just in the last two hours that the price is unacceptable. Um, uh, it was, it was um, said yesterday um, in the meeting in which um, you gave away information that was not supposed to be given away because we were under Chatham House rules. Um, and we, um, um, but, but the, I, 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 so I'm not going to, I'm not going to get into the specifics of what our um, plans, specific plans are at this point in time, um, but it is, um, um, but it will, it is not and has not been and will not be a single one off statement. Okay. And forgive me, you're right. I had totally forgotten that that's where I heard that. Um, and that it probably was, if, if it's not anywhere else in the public domain, I apologize. Um, the fact that, that you're, that, uh, that you folks brought that number forward yesterday, that was, that was my bad. So I apologize. Um, well, I think it, I think it's, it's incredibly personally, I think that folks will find, as you said, that this, you, you, you know, this is not what people usually see uh, leading patient groups do. And so I think it's, it's great that you guys have engaged on, on that point. Um, so let me pivot now over to, to Chris. So yeah, Chris, you've got your hand up. Hold on one second. You, you, you've got, this is, you're on in just a second. But um, I, I will admit that I had these fantasies. I could almost say they were, they were dreams. I could imagine waking up the morning that this drug was approved um, and hearing that you guys had priced it, let's just say at 5,600, that's the midpoint of our value-based price range. And you said to the public, we are honored to be the first. We recognize that the data are highly unusual given the two different trials. We know about the uncertainty. We are honored to be given this vote of confidence. And while we work on getting better data to demonstrate the full benefit of this treatment, we will price conservatively in a way that will still satisfy our investors, still keep innovation flowing in this direction, but that will allow us to demonstrate that we deserve a higher price. And until then, we will price uh, at a conservative, independently, kind of, if you will, a designated level. I had that fantasy and it didn't happen. Why not? How did you guys come up with 56,000? So thanks, Steve, for the opportunity to talk about this. Um, this is an area, obviously, that's very important and something we've spent a tremendous amount of energy. We are the, This is the first treatment. We fully recognize the responsibility that comes with that. And I just want to back up, though, too, because you hit patient out of pocket. Then you put up the slide on the uh, budget a lot, impact. A lot, a lot then we turn to some other things. So um, there was a lot of topics, and I'm assuming we'll probably get to all of them. But the, the big one at the start, since you had mentioned the Alzheimer's Association uh, patient numbers, 
um, is you know we're all trying to understand this new evolution. And this is not unique to new innovations that come forward. And I know there's been uh, different reports that have come out with regards, and it seems to be everyone is really uh, likes to grab big numbers and multiply them times price points and come up with you know, very, very high figures. And um, we have said from the beginning that we've spent a tremendous amount of time trying to understand who are the right patients, how many patients will actually be good candidates who could potentially benefit based on the clinical trial population that we studied. And we've come up with a number and we've been humble. We've said one to 2 million. I could give you the actual number we came up with, which is below 1.5, but we've said one to two because we wanna be humble and recognize we don't, you know, this is a new area, it will evolve. However, some have then grabbed that number and multiplied. And while we believe there's a potential eligible population that could be targeted there, and perhaps that's what the, you know, I don't wanna repeat the Alzheimer's Association piece since Matthew already kind of called out some of the aspects of that, but as others have come up with numbers that are even 500,000 potentially, potentially eligible, Mm -hmm. I want to stress something also, which is I know people like to grab the target population, but we've looked very carefully at a whole host of products that have launched in the last five to seven years. And many of them, remember, this is a complex new treatment in an area that hasn't previously had treatments. It's an infused biologic requiring monthly infusions and a complicated diagnostic workup involving a beta confirmation and then monitoring and management in a condition where we know screening, symptom awareness, recognition, even diagnosis is low. And so this will be a challenge um, for, you know, to go anywhere near the numbers that have been described. And when we've looked at a number of areas, even in areas that have been, you know, big breakthroughs in the last number of years, PD-1s for oncology, um, a number of immunology treatments, these treatments after even five years their uptake rates from the potentially eligible population are 10%, 12%, 19%. Across a number of treatments for these types of programs, it's, it's average of 11 to 16%. And if you look at even hepatitis C, the one people love to talk about from 2013, 2014, and hepatitis C with multiple products for an oral pill that was taken once a day for only three months, after five years of the introduction of novel um, hepatitis C treatments, the percentage on treatment from the eligible population was only 21% after five years, 21%. And so while we were very, we're trying to help here to understand the one to 2 million, we think it's going to be a fraction of that who actually are able to ultimately benefit. And we hope that will continue to evolve over time as we have more treatments. But I just want to characterize this correctly, which is we do not believe that there's going to be a large number of patients. Now, what we have said very publicly is we're the first treatment. We recognize that. We also are making a whole host of assumptions in everything I just said. And while we've spent tremendous energy to understand the population and what we think will happen based on what we've seen in other areas, both biologics and non-biologics, the reality is we want to be humble. We, what if we're wrong? What if we are fundamentally wrong? And so that's why we've come out and been very candid with regards to, we recognize this moment, we're going to watch this very carefully. And if we are fundamentally wrong and see numbers that are very different than what we've described, we stand ready to work with public, CMS certainly, and private payers to address both pricing so that we can achieve patient access and also importantly, budget sustainability. So I just wanna stress some of the points that we've made previously publicly on this. Um, because it's really important to understand this moment and what we see as an evolution, um, hopefully over the next five to seven years, that won't just be agile, but there'll be other treatments here. Um, we hope to see this evolution happen, but it's going to be fractions of the numbers that we've seen. Okay, let me just, uh, Pat had a comment and then I'm going to circle back to, but Pat, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Chris, you know, um, forecasting drug utilization uptake is actually a key part of my job, my team's job at Prime Therapeutics. We have 1.3 million commercially insured, I mean, uh, 16 million commercially insured members, 1.3 million Medicare and a million Medicaid. And we need to forecast uptake. We can't get Savaldi again. So um, we did forecast and we, we get numbers. Uh, I mean, I agree that the numbers we're seeing are, are probably not real, but I, I can share with you what our numbers are. So in 1.3 million, Medicare members, or we have integrated medical and pharmacy data, 
we see we have about a uh, hundred, I mean, a thousand, 116. So 1116 that carry a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease on a medical claim in their primary field in the last year. So that's 1% basically. And we know that's underrepresented as we've talked about already. And so we forecast that a range of 20 to 40% may take edge helm. And, if that, and, and also at a cost of, uh, you know, a lower cost of about 40,000 in the first year. That alone though is $7 on the low end, $7.44 per member per month on cost to Medicare. On the high end, that's $14.50. And the maximum amount that Hep C had hit anywhere in any line of business at any month was $7. And we know how much that impacted the ability to pay for healthcare during that short period of time. So already the actuaries that are writing premium and have to create premium now for two years from now are very concerned. So I know we could spend more time going back and forth on, on the budget impact. And I, I think it, it is, I mean, you can reach different numbers with using different kinds of assumptions. Um, I mean, Chris, how far back in, I mean, I know that, you know, the Congress is doing probes now of, of probably the FDA Biogen uh, interactions. I'm not sure how much of the pricing information will become public as it did during the investigations of Gilead during the Savaldi hearings, but how far back did the number 56,000 go in, in Biogen? I assume you were in the room as these numbers were discussed. How long ago was it that 56,000 was on the table? So, um, you know, so first off of the investigation, of course, we're gonna participate and support in any way not necessary. So let me just say that right up front. Um, and, you know, we've been assessing the value, we've been at, you know, developing this treatment for uh, over a decade, as you heard earlier. Uh -huh. And you, you've heard my background, I've worked in Alzheimer's now for 20 years and, and tragically all on failures until, um, until Agilehelm. And we've spent a lot of time over those years trying to understand the disease, trying to understand the burden, trying to understand what the potential impact of um, treatment benefits could potentially be here. And so I would say, you know, the understanding of this condition goes a long ways back and that will only continue. And I do have to say, since you put the slide up with the six products that are the large expenses, wow. um, you know, seeing Pat and hearing Pat's comments, uh, Pat, Steve, and Mark have heard me a number of times in the last three years since I returned from Europe. Every time I see a slide like that, I have to bring up the fact that in the US, we're missing an enormous opportunity for tremendous savings using biosimilars. And two of those products on there are either gonna be biosimilar soon or already biosimilars in Europe. Wouldn't it be fantastic if we could use some of those savings to start the recoup of those biosimilar savings to start investing in new treatments for Alzheimer's? Okay, so, so Chris, how, what year did the number 56,000 uh, become the central pricing point for, for Agilehelm? Steve, I, I see where you're going. I, I'm not, I'm not gonna you know, opine on the last, as everyone knows, this has been a complex journey over the last several years. Alzheimer's is complex. I'm not going to comment on that. Okay, um, but you're you're in the room when they're discussing the pricing as it as the thinking evolves over time, right? Yeah, it's been a it's been a long process involving a number of individuals. Okay, so let me show one other slide. It's the slide that was obtained by the Senate investigation of, of Gilead um, and its pricing, um, and I think I can get back to this again. Okay, let's hope that this works better than the last time. Um, all right, I think this will work. All right, can you guys see that slide? Can you see the one with all the heat map kind of look here? Okay, believe me, I'm not gonna walk through this extensively, but you know, during a Senate investigation, you often get access to things like this. This is a slide from Gilead that laid out their considerations as they came up with a price. And they were factoring in things like, would payers, you know, require some, this is for um, Savaldi, would payers require some kind of directly observed therapy? Would they delay treatment for certain patient groups? Would we hear pushback from patient groups? What would treatment guidelines say? Can you tell us what, I mean, as the Biogen public statements on justifying the price have come out, they actually have kind of covered a lot of ground. Everything from, this is what other monoclonal antibodies cost, to the value to patients and society, to innovation needs for the future. So like if this slide were obtained through a Senate investigation in the future, 
of the discussion inside Biogen, like what went, what were the factors that were being looked at? I assume patient group pushback was part of it, wasn't it? So, so Steve, you know, I'm happy to describe, you know, what the considerations were with regards to Alzheimer's in Adjahome. Um, you know, putting up the slide from Gilead, you know, I don't think is representative of the situation here or the moment that we're in. In the case of hepatitis C, there was first treatments in 2000. Those treatments were rewarded. They moved forward for a period of time with other treatments. There were multiple manufacturers coming in and incentivized to invest in those products. There's been a, a pretty good story of like the history there and what happened from the very first approval in hepatitis C until where they arrived in 2013 and 14 with Savaldi and the introduction of effectively a cure. I think the only analogy I'd like to take from the Gilead experience is the history of innovation based on first products. First products came in more than 15 years before that. It led to a reward for that product. The products were not a cure. They were not perfect. They had different, different effects, but it led to when they were rewarded, a whole host of new manufacturers coming in and out, taking risks in that area, investing in, failing most of them. But ultimately in 2013, look where we arrived at. Look what came immediately following that, where we had multiple treatments on the market now for effectively what many describe as a cure for hepatitis C. Right. I would love if I'm back here in 15 years on an Alzheimer's panel where we're talking about the advances and innovations that have, that have happened and we can refer back to that first treatment that came through and no patients at that point may be on edge, help them be on new treatments. I hope I hope that's all of that is, is, is true. Um, so you're not able to comment on what factors Biogen took into consideration in that kind of slide that Gilead used? There was no comparable process inside Biogen where factors were laid out, that kind of thing? No, 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 I'm, I'm happy to speak to that. So anyway, I appreciate you taking the slide down because I don't think that's a representative example of you know, how we think about things. You know, when it comes to the price that we've established and made the decisions around for Agihelm, um, we carefully um, and spent a tremendous amount of time as you've heard in other points before made um, at the time of approval. And you know, we thought very carefully about the overall impact and value that we believe this treatment can bring to patients, caregivers and society. And also one that will catalyze, incentivize and fuel future innovation. We think that's really important here. We did take into consideration the burden of the condition. This is a disease that already is costing $355 billion per year to US society. This is a tremendous burden on society. And we know, unlike what we see in oncology, other areas where you know, 15, 20, 25% of the overall burden is invested in medicines, tragically in Alzheimer's due to the failures, the amount of the burden invested in medicines in this category is less than 1%. And so we certainly took in the fact of this moment that we're in. Um, as being the first and, and only treatment to target the underlying or a defining pathology of Alzheimer's. Now, because we're in the ICER forum and because many of you were part of the sessions earlier, I have to make a mention with regards to, to value and, and value basing and value frameworks. Because um, if you don't ask, I'm sure you would, Steve, so maybe I just you know, get ahead of this, which is, you know, did we take um, value considerations and health frameworks into consideration? And some of you heard part of my response already earlier this morning. Absolutely, we do. We do take this very seriously as part of the consideration. You know, as the ISPOR uh, Task Force on Value Assessment has said, uh, value assessments should be used. They shouldn't be the only thing, but they should be used. And many of you know, I came from Europe three years ago. And while I think sometimes the Europe HTA system is a bit misunderstood on how it's actually applied, we do at Biogen take those things very seriously. And as I said earlier, the models that were created and presented earlier this morning by Dr. Whittington, they present a framework. And it started from a place that there was an assumption that, that the data was insufficient and then a pooling that we think is entirely inappropriate. It won't surprise any of you to hear that we believe that the basis for this should focus in many ways on, and when it comes to value assessment and frameworks and models like that, we should look at eMERGE. And we've described that both clinically, historically on why we think and we hope to re replicate those results with our post-marketing required study. And so our models that we're looking to publish highlight and go through the results of eMERGE to support this. Now, I know Steve, in your assessment, and you probably share that you have an optimistic scenario in which the team looked at, at that scenario as well. And it has different value-based price benchmarks than your base case. 
We don't believe that's optimistic. We believe that should be the base case based on all of the reasons we've described previously with regards to why um, the engage results support but don't refute the eMERGE findings. However, there's still a number of pessimistic assumptions that we feel are not supported by the model that was reported. And one of them namely, and Mel did a nice job of highlighting this, is there's an assumption that patients, once they transition on treatment from MCI to mild, that the efficacy would be halved. We don't agree with that. We have clinical trial data from MCI patients and mild patients who started in that stage. We don't believe there's any data to support that it should be halved in that stage. Secondly, when you transition then from mild into moderate, you've assumed that there's zero efficacy. And from our standpoint, while we will acknowledge we do not have data in that group, we haven't targeted them for starting, there's no reason that we believe it's plausible why you would have zero efficacy, not waning. And equal to that, you- Chris, let me just, Chris, let me just because of our time, and I know we, we kind of talked about the model earlier, and I mean, you and I could go to town on, on some of these assumptions. Um, I hear your, I, I know what you're saying in terms of you guys have different uh, opinions about what those assumptions should have been. And um, I will point out that our model will be available, you know, through ICER analytics for people to put in different assumptions in some of those ways. But I, I just wanted to pull you back again to the pricing. Um, 56,000 is, a, is, a, uh, is an, in some ways an interestingly precise number. It's not 50, it's not 60, it's not even 55. So somehow 56 came out of some process. And it just feels like if this is such a transformative moment for America to think about the first um, disease modifying treatment for Alzheimer's, I kind of feel like you might have a special burden to be transparent about the basis of that number. It sounds like it came out of an equation or some kind of slide like the one that Gilead used. Um, is there anything more that you can share with uh, you know, the public about 56? Because honestly, you know you've gotten a huge amount of blowback on this pricing issue. And I think you could have been national heroes if you'd come out in that alternative reality that I talked about. So 56K has been a problem for you. I just wonder, can you say anything more to explain and justify it in a concrete way? Yeah, so, and where I was building to, Steve, was you've made a number of assumptions to make the conclusions that the ICER team has, and we respect that. We've also made assumptions, and that's what models are based on. And our assumptions do support, and our publication will also support pricing in line with what we've had, or where we've priced Adjahel. We believe that supports the number. Now, you will say, well, you didn't include uh, perhaps the engaged results. And I would say, well, that's true, but I will tell you there's another things we didn't include as well, which we have 18 month studies. We acknowledge that. And we know Alzheimer's is a disease that's much more important. What happens after 18 months? And as you showed earlier on a slide, you saw, showed the and emerge results after patients who got to target dose and stayed on target dose, greater than 14 doses and what their results. What we didn't do is we didn't try to say, we've removed the underlying, or we removed the defining pathology of the disease. It may continue to increase. We didn't do that. We also didn't take a different approach. We focused on the ITT results from eMERGE of CDR sum of boxes. Now, what we didn't do was, as many have said, well, functioning is more important in this condition. You should model those results. And as everyone knows in our, in our product insert in the label, it has the results from eMERGE where the, I, the functioning uh, endpoint was different by 40%, not 22 and we also didn't, as some had thought we might, try to include every cost we could find. As everyone knows, ISPOR has established a value flower of a whole host of components, which we do think are very valuable and important. We didn't try to include every cost. We acknowledge there isn't data in some of those places. And so we took that approach. That supports our pricing in addition to some of the considerations that I mentioned earlier, Steve. So I hope that's helpful. All right, good. Well, I, I know we'll all look forward to seeing that uh, when it comes out publicly. One last question, and then we will actually move on from this. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of assuming, because I've had these conversations obviously with, not just with you, but many other folks, that um, the delivery system considerations come into play when you're thinking about your price. And you knew that this drug would be delivered by doctors who would make a percent um, profit, if you will, to cover, you could say, their expenses, but they would, they would receive a percent on top of the 
of the price from Medicare. Um, again, this may come out in, a, in investigations or not, but did that factor in at all to your thinking about what the influence would be on whether doctors would be willing to provide it? Did there have to be enough for them to take on top of the cost of the drug to make it worth their while? The infrastructure components related to uptake of new conditions um, certainly impacted what we thought about from a budget impact and how we think about what the impacts of that could be. Um, as far as the physician behavior dynamics, no, not at all. Okay. Thank you, Chris. All right. In my bizarre way of having to jump from very important issues to another very important issue with almost no ceremony or social graces, let me do it again. But Chris, thank you. And thank you again for being part of this meeting. Uh, I think you and I both know that a lot of companies would not be where you are right now, um, fielding that kind of question with the kind of grace and respect that, that you're showing, and I appreciate that. Let's talk about coverage. So we've talked about price, so let's move on to coverage because that is gonna be a big issue. Um, I mentioned some of the doctors groups that are announcing they're not going to use it themselves. We have some health plans that are announcing that they're not going to use it. Um, it's not in a protected class. So within Medicare Advantage and other areas, there's more flexibility for private payers to non-cover uh, if they wish. Um, and I wanna talk about private coverage first and then we'll pivot to, um, to the Medicare side of things. So we've got Pat and, and Leslie. And Leslie, in her role, um, really sees a lot of plans and their thinking around what's going to happen. Um, Leslie, what do you think the considerations are going to be around cover, no cover, and then we'll get into the specific, if they are going to cover, what would the kind of eligibility criteria look like? But what are you sensing about the way that doctors, and I'm sorry, about health plans, who are they looking to, who are they talking to, how are they gonna be making this decision? Um, that's a great question, Stephen. Um, and I just wanted to say something though about that previous conversation. And I think Chris, that you may have alluded to this or others have alluded to it, um, but, payers, and I think we're talking commercial right now, um, are uh, not looking at this as 56,000, but they're looking at it at probably 100,000 per person because they're adding in PET scans, MRIs, every single thing that they have to, which there's this figure out there, right or wrong, 100,000, not 56. And I know we sort of alluded to it, but one other issue, and this has been very common, and we have had a lot of meeting with a lot of our uh, subscribers, is um, that the PET scan, the amyloid, not covered by CMS. I know that they're now starting to look at what a national coverage termination um, could be, whether that changes or not. And that's a huge uh, problem because those can be up to $5,000 um, per test. And when we talked about inequities before, you have your wealthier people that would say, hey, anything for my mother versus um, others that won't be able to do it. So I just had to put that out there for the time being. Um, a little bit, um, so we have never had more calls from our subscribers on day one than we have on this medication. And um, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, so that's number one. Um, to getting to your point, Stephen, that I'm going to give you like a few different things that we have been asked about again and again and again. Um, there are some that have decided not to um, right now approve it and pay for it because they're saying it's investigational. You mentioned that at the very beginning. Some of the blues, I think today we heard about Cleveland Clinic, Mount Sinai. So there are those there. Um, we do have a lot of uh, payers and insurers in the United States that are actually um, saying, well, we feel like we have to, but the biggest issue is going to be, um, how can we make sure it is the appropriate patient? I can tell you that the new indication was extremely welcomed by everybody because there were um, quite a few, uh, there, was, there was a lot of angst that if they put on it stricter criteria than the very first indication, the broad indication, that they would not be able to stick with that because they would be overruled by um, some sort of organization. So that was actually extremely welcomed. Um, and then finally, it's how do we pick the correct patient? 
And the reason that this is going to be so hard um, is because we've all talked about today. I don't have to reiterate every single thing why. However, what everybody does understand, if once, once the barn door is open, <laughs> you're not going to get everything, everybody uh, back in to the barn. That's sort of what it is, meaning that if you have people that really are not the appropriate patients on it, it's going to be very hard to stop um, them from getting it. Likewise, um, a huge issue, huge, is going to be how can we assess if it's working or not. And I know we've just spent hours talking about this. I don't have to go through why, but it's every single thing that you've said. So these are the questions. Again, some payers are going to cover it. Almost every single one wants to put on a prior authorization criteria sets, um, but they're really looking for how do we assess the person once we have it? What's continuation of therapy look like? How are we going to pay for it? Okay, thank you. We'll come back to the coverage criteria and, and pretty, we'll, we'll walk through them pretty quickly, but we'll do so in a way that we'll get your input on some of those too. Pat um, Gleason, um, five blues, maybe more, I think um, have said they're not going to cover it. Um, what's going on? Um, there's a lot of concern, as you know, in some quarters that this is being treated unfairly, that accelerated approval drugs are covered in oncology. Um, what's different about this one? Why are some of the blues not covered? Yeah, I, I, that's a great question, Steve. And, and I'll just say that, uh, so Prime Therapeutics uh, with 19 blues clients, some of, many of them are owners. Um, we are asked to provide a clinical evaluation and use our, um, our physician, and pharmacist and healthcare professional P and T pharmacy and therapeutics committee that's used to create our formulary. And by the way, those decisions are made on clinical evidence only and don't include any consideration of economics. So if we internally do a, a review of all literature. We'll use the ICER information. We'll use anything published, anything about the drug that we can obtain. And, and thanks from, you know, we submit information requests to Biogen and others and even great literature to create a dossier and then make a recommendation. And then that goes to our external PNT of experts, including neurologists and cardiologists that then make the final say. And so I'll read to you our current position statement that goes to the blues plans though. And this is a medical benefit drug, if you recall. So it's the blues plan then through their medical policy that they'll then create and they may use information from, our, from what we've generated for the final decision. So you've mentioned some of the blues, three of them are our owners, Kansas, Blues of Kansas, North Carolina, and Florida Blue have already said uh, publicly that they determined that through their processes, maybe informed by our information as well, that Educanumab is considered experimental and not medically necessary for all indications, but not limited to Alzheimer's disease as clinical benefit has not been established. This is not financial. This is the evidence of the clinicals, the, cl the, the safety and efficacy data available. So that is Prime's position statement and it has been adopted by some blues plans, including those that are Prime Blue and those that are outside of our family of blues. Um, and you know, happy to discuss further around the decision-making there, as well as we have a, a medical policy standard we've created with very specific criteria then I think we're going to go there next but I, I'm happy to further answer questions Steve you have on that no that's that, that I think that's very helpful um I think oh, it, you, I, I'm sorry you, you asked about other products so I, I do want to say that this is not unique so um Exondus 51 Biondus 53 are also in this status and they're they've been on the market for a number of years they came with very similar evidence as Edgehelm on a surrogate endpoint their primary endpoint was not, they didn't hit it. It was not statistically significant finding of evidence of stopping or slowing disease progression for Duchenne's muscular dystrophy of two, two different forms, uh, 51 exon type and 53 exon type. So, and, and the not medically necessary position on those two products has been in place since launch and 90% of our plants still hold that positioning on those products. And also I'll say that, and cause I'm sure I'm gonna get the blowback that this is only for expensive agents. We have generic pennies on the dollar products that we have determined are also not medically necessary that are prescribed, you know, prescription only in the United States. So, um, you know, this isn't unique to Agihome. I wanna be clear on that. 
Do you think the decision would have been the same if it had been 5,600 bucks? I think it could have been. Okay. I think it very well could have been based on, because the evidence isn't there that it works and there is a safety concern. Okay. All right, I, I'm very sensitive that we could, again, spend the whole rest of our policy roundtable now talking about whether it should or shouldn't be covered by private insurers. This will be, my, this will be mainly covered by Medicare, so I wanna get there. But because the criteria will be important, and in some ways what Medicare will be doing and through its national coverage determination process, is coming up with its own approach to designing a coverage policy that will have coverage uh, criteria, if you will. So I wanted to run through the general categories of criteria that exist in a coverage policy and get quick input, not on what is right or wrong necessarily really, but more kind of how will plans think through the choice. And this is now assuming that it is covered or sometimes you have to have these criteria you know, for exceptions um, anyway. But the question is, how are these criteria going to be framed um, to match, in some ways, the label and the evidence? So just jumping in, the, trial, uh, the trials had patients between 50 to 85. So I'm assuming that most health plans will just plug that into the age spot in their policy and will kind of just move on from there and have to deal with others as a, as a different kind of exception. Diagnosis is going to be a tricky one. Right, so the FDA changed its label um, and they said it should be initiated in patients with mild cognitive impairment or mild dementia stage of disease. So an insurance company has to figure out how do we operationalize that? Do we just let a doctor tick a box that says mild cognitive improvement or do we use some kind of specific tests to do this? So. I'll just say it's possible that health plans will first ask doctors to do a bunch of labs to exclude other conditions, uh, syphilis, vitamin B12 deficiency, thyroid disease. It's possible that all of these will be part of the coverage criteria for a patient to get access. Um, the cognitive function tests are gonna be a big deal. As you've heard from our clinical experts, they don't use the CDR sum of boxes in clinical practice. They use usually the MMSE or the MOCA. So I think a lot of plans are gonna be looking at the eligibility criteria for the studies um, linked to that and find that for instance, MMSCs greater than or equal to 24 would be one way to frame it or MOCAs greater than or equal to 19. Let me just pause there and first go back to Leslie and Pat. Am I describing the way that plans will think through this accurately? Is there anything you'd wanna to add to that? And then I'll ask the clinical experts. Yeah how we use the tests the right way if we're using them to define mild cognitive improvement. Yeah, I'll start too. So for the time being, you're extremely right, Steve. There's really nothing else to say um, that everybody does know that the CDR was really not used. It's used more in studies. In fact, um, all of our non-academic uh, subscribers um, have mentioned that. So it's definitely going to be the MOCA and the MSA. So you're on top of that. Um, I will say one thing though, at the very beginning is that sure. um, uh, there's definitely, there may be inclusive of a lower age group also. Um, okay. Yeah. So that is uh, another um, out there. So I'll stop at that for as far as Pat, I don't know if you want to Pat, yeah, we're, we're, we're not going lower on an age group. I'll just say yeah. um, that's my only addition there. Okay. Um, some of this can seem dry, I know, but it, it is important for us to get some perspectives on the table. So clinical experts, um, are you comfortable with this general idea of using the MMSC and or the MOCA um, as, as the way that clinicians should diagnose mild cognitive impairment or mild dementia? Well, maybe maybe I'll start and I'll say no, but then the question is what would the alternative be? And that said, I think probably MMSC or MOCA are reasonable to fall. Well, that said, you know, these are not good diagnostic tools. They weren't designed that way. Um, there is a lot of day-to-day -day variability. I can see if someone is being pushed to be to receive a certain medication that maybe they'll be given the task twice. They'll come back a month later, a week later, where there might be some uh, mild uh, practice carryover effects. So they can be misused as well. But, but again, um, Although I think an expert geriatrician, a geriatric psychiatrist, neurologist might do better than 
uh, using a MOCA score or an MMSE score, I think more generally something like that um, it, it is not an unreasonable thing to be considering. Okay. Um, let me move. I'm going to be a little bit abrupt again. Feel free to really stop me if you feel like you have to. But let me move to neuroimaging because I can imagine, I wrote down here again, plans are going to think is, do we just have this cognitive study? Will they have to get a PET as well? Um, I'm assuming many plans will again follow the clinical trial approach and say, yes, they have to have both. And that raises the very important question of coverage of PET, certainly in Medicare. Um, so there, there's clearly some Gordian knot there that's going to have to be solved. If Medicare is going to create an NCD and other plans are going to start to require amyloid PET, um, somebody's got to cover it. Um, but Pat or Leslie, I mean, would you imagine that plans would require a PET um, and obviously they as private plans would cover it? So we're saying PET or CSF assay with am showing amyloid pathology. So okay. either or. And, and I would agree with that. There are some that I go with either or. Um, as far as coverage or not, I think a lot of determining whether they could cover it. Um, I think also that there are um, other organizations that are looking to see um, if patients would be paying for it also. And if, um, can you have a patient pay? And I don't know, Mark, you may be able to later on even address this, but uh, can you have a patient pay uh, for certain non-CMS covered testing, which there are certain ways you could possibly do that. Um, so I, the answer is yes, they're discussing all of the above. Okay. All right. So let me, I'm going to actually have to skip. And, oh, sorry. Did somebody want to jump in? Yeah. Um, if I can jump in, if you're talking about CSF, a lot of, um, older adults, um, it, it's a hard test to do. Sometimes it's harder to perform given, um, bony changes that occur with aging. It's not a test that you would do in someone who's anticoagulated, but also the question comes up for someone who's on antiplatelet medications, which is a much broader population, whether or not they can undergo lumbar puncture safely. Yeah, um, so we'd exclude all those. So, I mean, you know, we talked about anticoagulated. There's a step later that says you can't get edgy helmet if you're anticoagulated or on any antiplatelet other than low dose. And, and the other consideration is if monitoring is going to involve MRI scans and people have hardware implanted from different surgical procedures, then they wouldn't be able to be monitored in the same way that was done during the clinical trial in the same way um, that the FDA is now recommending. Good point, that's a good point. All right, so I am gonna skip lightly over the exclusions because I think, again, plans will look at what the exclusion criteria were for the uh, clinical trials. And we've heard clinically that it kind of makes sense not to have you know people on blood thinners uh, take the treatment, but we've also heard that may create a, a, a conundrum for some patients who might want to get the treatment and give up their blood thinners. There are other kinds of things related to history of heart conditions, um, et cetera. But I, I wanna ask a, a quick question on provider qualifications. You know, Some new treatments um, are restricted for prescription by specialists, others are available to be prescribed by primary care doctors. Um, how do we envision the, the plans wanting to approach this, uh, Pat and Les, uh, Leslie? Will they uh, keep this in the hands of card-carrying neurologists, or what are they going to do? There are three. Uh, I'll start that. You can um, add to this. Uh, there are three, actually, um, that we see most plans going to be limiting it to. Definitely geriatricians, psychiatric um, geriatricians, and neurologists. Um, and those are the three. I don't think we've ever... Um, talk to any uh, of our subscribers that have not wanted to limit it to certain groups of physicians. Okay. Pat, anything different on that? I uh, concur. Uh, our text reads, uh, specialist in the area of patient's diagnosis or the prescribers consulted with a specialist. Okay. Now I have, I want to spend about five minutes on a really tricky area that Leslie raised earlier. Okay, we've started a patient on the treatment. Health plans are gonna have coverage that says how long they can take it. It's either gonna be six months or 12 months. And there's gonna to have to be something at the end of that phase that's either going to ask the doctor to decide whether it's working on their own and they can do it if they want, or they'll have to use tests again to show that the treatment is either 
stabilize the patient or not getting really worse or, or something. And this is tough because you could imagine the health plan could require um, what, another PET scan to show that amyloid has been removed, but no, most patients it's removed. That's not really the outcome that people are interested in. So have you guys thought through yourselves, Pat or Leslie, or heard from others, are they going to try to use the cognitive tests in particular to, to demonstrate stability or worsening? How, how are they gonna frame the decision of whether to continue treatment after that first six or 12 month phase? Leslie, you wanna go or Pat, whichever. Because this is, um, this, is hard. this is tough. Yeah, so uh, when we have this criteria, if, if the MME drops below 19, then the evidence, there's not evidence that that edgy home should be used in that population. So that's gonna disqualify a continuation. Um, or if they were doing the CDR, some of boxes it drops less than nine. Um, also that they need to be trying to get to 10 milligram per kilogram. So if they, they haven't made it there and they're not intending to go further, that that's going to disqualify continuation. And then along the way, um, we're, we are testing in the early phase. I'm just, to, I, I need to call this out that when they first are approved for 12 months, because we're, we're saying a 12 month approval, that they, the provider is going to test to do an MRI at seven and 12 months and then right. test to, you know, appropriate care if they, based on findings. But, and, but the MRI too is for the ARIA also. Right. So, so, so I mean, that's what it's for. So if yeah, yeah. Finding, it's for the ARIA, not, not right. Okay. Right. It's not for tracking, it's for ARIA. Yes. Thanks for right, the right, right. Thanks. Now there are other issues I could raise, but again, I'm Can I jump in for one second? Yes, Laura, please because go ahead. We're talking about um, disparity a little while ago, and I'm listening to these insurance recommendations or requirements, and people with less resources and in remote areas are not going to be able to do that. I mean, I, I, like you're listing like a geriatric psychiatrist and, and all of these specialists to prescribe this drug. This is incredibly exclusive. Uh, you know what, Laura, we have actually talked to people, it's a fabulous point, we have actually talked to people in some states such as North Dakota, and there, and again, there may be some, but they don't think there are. Um, we have actually talked to different organizations that are trying to try to set up clinics, and they're actually saying that they're not going to probably cover this, at least for the time being, but they're going to see how they can set up a clinic so that they will have people who are educated in these tests that can bring people in. Um, but if you're, especially, I don't know where you live, but if you're in a rural area, and I'm not in a rural area, if you're in a rural area, this is definitely going to be, if you do, are not near either a physician that can do this or a full clinic that can set this up and you need a full clinic on this. You just don't need one physician looking at you. This is a huge problem. So you, right on, we, we totally understand that, Laura. So I, I just want everyone to think about this because when we were talking about the disparity later and we were looking at possibly, you know, maybe not doing some things because it was going to promote more inequality. I think we should take this into consideration that this is going to be the situation in the beginning mm -hmm. anyway, maybe. So yeah. um, just well, well, thank you. I think you're absolutely right. And um, I think Matthew also made the point to a certain extent that um, this may serve as a spark that will help us all as a health system figure out what we will need to do to get it right as new treatments come online. I mean, if we, we need better diagnostic facilities and treatment, and, and a lot of new things do start out in the hands of specialists and then spread as, as the system kind of gets used to it. But we'll have to figure out how to make that process as quick as possible when we have um, treatments that are, are, are really judged to be effective and, and people want to get them to everybody. Steve, right. Steve, could, yeah. Steve could, could, yeah. Yeah, could, I, could, could I quickly just add on to that point? Because I think it's really important that, that you know, there's been a lot of discussion today about the effectiveness of this, of this particular drug. But even with a drug that's more effective, let's not lose sight of the drug. The drug, a drug is not the 
is not the end of what's needed by people living with Alzheimer's disease. Um, there is there are serious health system deficiencies when it comes to the post diagnosis care that they receive from from care planning to care coordination um, to the transition into into the need for long term care. So I I, I think that I just wanted to kind of underscore where you were going with the, the health delivery system. And it's more than just this drug or any drug, even when you have a drug. Thank you. Yeah, and you brought me right back to my own family's experience and many other people's. It's like, um, it's not just the health system either. It's like the whole infrastructure for care for families um, uh, helping with patients with Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia. So good point. All right, I wanna, move to, I wanna move to Mark. Oh, I'm sorry, Sarah. Go ahead quickly and then I wanna move to Mark because we're gonna talk about Medicare in a second. I just wanted to add one more point to, to Laura's, which is I hear you that, you know, this is gonna be very exclusive if you leave it to just those specialists to prescribe it. On the flip side, and something that we've been worried, worried about from the specialist side is knowing how prevalent Alzheimer's disease is, we feel that this absolutely needs to fall in the realm of primary care at some point. But honestly, primary care doctors at the moment are not well versed in making the diagnosis. And we know it, I hate to say it only because we know that when patients go to the primary care doctor and say, I have a problem, oftentimes it takes a while before you can finally get to a specialist and, and you finally get a diagnosis, but you've known that something's been going on. And that's not a ding on primary care. It's just, that's not what they do. It's what we do. And so we are working on educating them to be able to make them have power to be able to understand how to make that diagnosis better and feel more comfortable. So for the moment to make a good diagnosis and accurate, it rests with a specialist, which does leave so many people out. It's our job to help educate our primary care colleagues so that they become more comfortable and this can get to more people across the country. Thank you, these are really good comments. Thank you very much, Sarah. Okay, I wanna to shift to Medicare. Mark, thank you for being here with us. So I wanna talk about Medicare coverage options and then that will bleed right into um, issues around the confirmatory trial and other research. So uh, doing nothing and leaving it up to the Medicare regions was on the table for a short while. It's now off the table. Um, the Alzheimer's Association called for an NCD and the next day it happened. So way to go, Matthew and team. Uh, you, you had some, some throughput there for sure. Um, now an NCD though, most Americans have no idea what we're talking about, a national coverage determination. They figure Medicare always has national coverage determinations. Just to be clear, it can, lend, it can end up in a decision not to cover. It can end up in a decision to cover for some people, but not everybody. And it can use terms just like private insurers. In fact, it does to create that specified patient eligibility criteria. And it can, but doesn't have to be linked to the idea of coverage with evidence development, which says we will give you coverage if you are enrolled in such and such type of a clinical trial or this specific trial. So Mark, you know more than any other person on earth probably, all the different things that are going through the heads of the folks at CMS right now. Um, and you're not going to obviously talk out of school, but help us, just like I was asking Leslie and Pat, what is going through their minds as they weigh this process? They, for one thing, they're gonna be burning the midnight oil. They've got six to nine months to pull this off and they've got a huge amount of pressure on them. What are they gonna be thinking about? Um, and especially under CED, what are some of the pros and cons they're gonna be weighing as they try to figure out whether to do CED or not. Yeah, see, first of all, glad to be here with all of you and um, interesting to hear this discussion over the last uh, part of the session I was able to make. Uh, this is such a uh, critical and timely set of issues and, and glad to be a part of it. And I wasn't here when you introduced me, uh, hopefully said something nice, but also just wanna make sure people know I'm on the board of J&J &J and, and, and Cigna among uh, other disclosures. Um, but uh, to get to your question, there actually isn't a national coverage decision in place right now. And to go back to these um, issues, that the concerns that people have about access on the one hand, costs on the other, right now, and I think for a, for a while, um, the access is going to be pretty limited, um, at least until that nine month period is over. And I'll get, I'll get to that in just a second. But uh, for right now, 
Um, as you've heard from, from uh, um, uh, uh, the people on the panel and others from, um, about uh, the, the limitations of our current healthcare delivery system, most of the people who could qualify don't have an easy path to it, especially if they're in a rural area or have to pay co-pays under you know, any traditional uh, insurance plan. And um, for another thing, um, these coverage decisions aren't in place yet. Um, and I would encourage people to look ahead that, that during this period when Medicare is going to be making its this the, uh, determination, uh, there's going to be some more evidence coming out. Probably not so much from the on the aducanumab itself. Um, unfortunately, in retrospect, at least those uh, trials were stopped prematurely, and we need a better position now if they had been continued on. Um, um, but from the other treatments in this class, at least three other drugs in advanced clinical trials that will be having readouts, maybe not the pivotal readouts in the next few months, but there are Alzheimer's meetings coming up where there will be new evidence uh, coming out around whether or not there's a class effect here, uh, whether or not these drugs that really do show an impact on um, reducing plaques have an impact on um, some of the cognitive outcomes, at least that we've talked about. Uh, and also questions like, does dosing need to be indefinite? Uh, what, what's the right level? Can we target better to other patients? So this is an area where we're at early days here and there's gonna be a lot uh, more evidence coming out over the next few years uh, and months even that will hopefully influence this. And, and just one other point, and then I'll get to your question. You, you know me, I'm, I'm a, a big believer in things like innovative approaches like coverage with evidence development and paying differently. Um, we've spent a lot of time over the last 20 years um, supporting the FDA on a bipartisan basis to give it additional resources to uh, look at innovative ways of designing trials, to consider approaches like accelerated approval and so forth. And maybe need to relook at that a bit. But I just want to emphasize there's been no comparable attention to dealing with innovative therapies, especially ones that may have important long-term effects uh, that don't get fully understood in the pre-market clinical trial phase, think gene therapies and others, as well as chronic uh, uh, treatments, uh, treatments for chronic conditions like uh, like uh, Alzheimer's, uh, we don't have any comparable changes on the uh, on the payment side. CMS is still operating off the the basic rules that it had uh, um, you know 20 years ago, if not 40 or 50 years ago. In the coverage division, the part of CMS that reviews these issues, there probably are about half as many people with advanced expertise as there were when I was administrator, uh, and that's in marked contrast to a huge amount of public investment and support for really trying to get the infrastructure right and the systems right on the pre-market side. We've got a mismatch there and I hope we can do something about it. And the same thing goes for paying for care in a way that really encourages the kind of models that Sarah was talking about uh, that are more focused on the person, early diagnosis, efficient treatment. Um, so we've got a ways to go and I hope this is a wake up call. There are more coming with some more of the cellular therapies and others in development. Okay, so I've said my piece now onto, uh, onto your question. So uh, Medicare is, uh, the people at Medicare are looking for uh, help, I think. So I'm gonna put in the chat there, you can submit a comment right now uh, on the national coverage determination process for what you'd like them to do. And there's going to be a lot of uh, requests for input. So CMS has a couple of public meetings already scheduled where they want to get some ideas on how they should think about the evidence, how they should do things like maybe limit coverage in some ways or include uh, uh, an evidence development component along with it. Uh, they're probably going to have at least one meeting of the Medicare Coverage Advisory Committee, a group of experts that will be augmented by people who know a lot about this space from different uh, expert and stakeholder and patient perspectives. Uh, and uh, there will probably be, I know we're going to be at Duke, Margola is going to be involved in some uh, public processes around uh, helping to find a, a path forward here during that time. Uh, but the key dates are um, six months is when CMS has said they'll have a proposed version of their coverage decision out sometime in January. That's a pretty uh, good, uh, that's a pretty aggressive pace by CMS standards. Sometimes occasionally they take less time. Uh, usually they take longer, especially for something as big and important as this one. Uh, that's a pretty fast pace given the limit 
limited resources that CMS has to devote to this. As you said, NCDs are not that common. You know, maybe 10 a year, they're going, numbers are going down. Again, it's a resource limitation issue, not a, an issue of, you know, technology has somehow gotten easier uh, in recent years. Um, and then three months after that, um, CMS is going to have a final uh, coverage decision. So by um, next, uh, what is it, April, uh, mid-April, um, uh, there will be a coverage determination in place. And pro that, that may well include, as you said, some evidence development components. Um, so we can talk more about that. I do want to emphasize between now and then, it's not that Medicare is not covering it. Um, the local coverage uh, processes, Steve, that you mentioned, those are actually in place right now. So uh, any Medicare administrative contractor that gets a claim from a provider in their region uh, can cover or not uh, using the standards that they might apply. And they function, I think their path, they're probably going through some of the same issues and thinking uh, that you are. Um, I, I, my sense is that most of them are basically saying no. And if you're a physician and you submit a claim now uh, to Medicare for, uh, for this product and the, and the Medicare administrative contractor says, we haven't gotten any guidance from, um, uh, from central CMS yet, your answer shouldn't be, um, okay, um, well, we've got to wait. Your answer should be, well, that you're basically saying no. Um, so CMS has said they're going to provide that national guidance in, in nine months. Uh, but right now, um, they're very limited coverage. And so I think we're not going to see very big numbers in the near term. The numbers that we are going to see are probably going to be driven more by some of the issues that Laura raised, you know, people who have, can afford uh, more access or have more access based on where they live and the way their particular healthcare provider is set up. But it will probably be pretty limited for the coming months. Um, but, but I do want to emphasize how important this NCD process is for this drug and for this class of products. Uh, I would estimate, or the estimates I've seen are something like 80% uh, of the patients that may potentially be eligible for this treatment based on the revised um, FDA uh, label uh, for mild cognitive impairment and early stage, 80% are, are on Medicare. Um, and uh, Pat may make your life a little bit easier down the road and that you know your Medicare Advantage plan is gonna have to follow the, uh, the NCD as well uh, nine months from now. So this is where the the action is going to be uh, for the um, for for this class of products. Great, Mark. Thank you. Um, sensitive to the time again. Let me follow up with you quickly. So let's just assume that Medicare is weighing CED, um, and I was there uh, at the time. You were head of CMS at that time, and CED was relatively young. But even then, it was pretty obvious that it would be hard to do CED and require a randomized controlled trial because it would make people feel like I've got Medicare, but I've only got a 50-50 chance of getting uh, what should be part of my, my benefit. Others thought that we could do RCTs under um, coverage with evidence development. What do you see as the, the likelihood that people will go forward with, um, with some idea, given that FDA actually told Biogen that they wanted to see a randomized control trial as part of the confirmatory trial um, data. What is Medicare going to weigh as part of the decision around CED? Sorry, CED for those who have been using it too flippantly. It's coverage with evidence development. It's a tool, a policy tool at Medicare that allows them to cover only if the beneficiary participates in a trial of some kind. It may be a registry. It, it can be some kind of evidence generating process. Um, and it's a tool that is not used all that often, but it has been used and actually marked was central in its creation and early launch. So Mark, again, the type of trial that you think they'll be thinking of if they do CED? Well, um, in this process, they're gonna have a wide range of ideas proposed and they already have. Um, so CED has been used in conjunction with broad coverage. It's been used, as you said, limiting coverage to people who participate in some kind of evidence development. You can also do some versions of both and. It's been used to cover treatments in randomized trials only. Uh, that's typically for off-label uses where um, there's some uh, uh, suggestion that the treatment may benefit and, and CMS may want to get ahead or uh, the evidence is um, uh, for a population that's adjacent to one that's important to, uh, to Medicare. 
uh, it would be unusual for there to be a randomized trial requirement in a case like this, where the drug has been approved for everyone. And, and you know, Steve, I think you're also implying this, uh, potentially some uh, political obstacles as well. Um, so, and in response to that and recognizing that, I've heard from, you know, some of my colleagues already who are trying to think about this hard problem of how do we develop further um, randomized trial evidence and suggesting things like, well, maybe Maybe you could do it at the uh, the regional level or, or at the, the the provider level. Again, I think those are those are challenging. Um, uh, hard to explain to the American public and people who have a parent or, or someone they care about um, who's at this stage and facing this this really tough uh, uh, diagnosis that that just because you happen to live here or go to this or that provider, you can or can't uh, uh, get access. So, so that's gonna be challenging, but you'll see some uh, creative ideas, maybe um, by trying out um, some different models of care, like um, uh, shared decision-making process, and then comparing people who are, are matched in many ways, but, but do or don't decide to um, get, um, uh, get treated when they go through that. You know, a lot, a lot of creative ideas. Um, much more feasible to do in this kind of context is uh, kind of, as you were saying, an observational um, registry type approach. You know, CMS has done that uh, a lot. Um, maybe a good um, kind of analogy here would be what happened with um, uh, the transaortic valve replacements. So this is a um, valve procedure that was developed and tested primarily in non-Medicare beneficiaries, uh, came onto the market in 2012, or, or CMS had an NCD with CED in 2012 where it ended up covering more broadly than some people had expected just based on the, the label. So again, it's a little bit different context, um, but did several things. One was requiring certain kinds of clinical evaluation. Second was requiring certain kinds of provider capabilities along the lines that we were talking about before. And third was requiring uh, some kind of uh, data collection to track how patients were doing. There are many things that I think can be helped uh, where that kind of evidence can be really useful at observational evidence, like understanding the prevalence of safety issues, uh, understanding how ARIA actually occurs in the real world and what the consequences are and how to manage it, um, understanding which types of patients uh, may be more or less uh, responsive when they're, uh, when they're treated, so predictive models and, and refining our understanding of the course uh, of, um, uh, of Alzheimer's disease now that it matters more, um, try maybe uh, if, if, uh, if at some point in time there's another treatment approved, again, several in advanced development that uh, could potentially be headed for FDA within the next year or two, uh, maybe comparative uh, studies, uh, dosing, timing, things like that, but hard to do just a, a placebo control. So I think there'll be a lot of effort in the coming weeks to, to think about how we can find good, reliable kind of control populations uh, for this uh, for this kind of evidence question. But again, it also would, would encourage people to look at what we're going to see in the other randomized trials that are going on now that we'll be reporting out in the coming months where there were patients, the same drug class uh, with, you know, sort of big effects on removing plaques randomized to placebo or not uh, to see if there is, uh, you know, at, at least a class effect here too. Good. Thank you, Mark, very much. Um, we don't have time, unfortunately, to dive into the, the different trial opportunities. Obviously, uh, some people will say that we might learn many of the things that you mentioned and still not know whether the drug actually works um, because that relative effectiveness outside of a randomized design might be just very difficult to do. Um, but also, unfortunately, given in some ways the difficulty in rolling this out more broadly, if it's going to be studied, that can offer an opportunity for a wait list kind of approach, which is a, a kind of a quasi experimental approach. So lots of work will go into that. Yeah, try, try explaining that in front of a congressional oversight hearing I, I, for, oh, wait everybody list for Alzheimer's wait treatment. Yeah. We'll, we'll figure out a wait list uh, <laughs> analogy. You need okay. a different term, Steve. <laughs> OK, OK, the staggered knockout. Okay, but you're right, it's not very politically uh, uh, adept of me. I, I leave that to your fine, uh, fine sensibilities. Uh, I want to give Chris uh, Leibman one last chance to say something quickly, and then we're actually going to sum up with you guys. Um, but Chris, I, I'm not going to unfortunately be able to do any uh, credit to the ideas that you already have had about your confirmatory trial. 
Um, obviously, people are wondering whether you're going to do RCTs overseas and use that for what the FDA is asking you. Um, any insight, uh, and it has to be brief, I'm sorry, but on how you are thinking through this and your own sense of how it may or may not dovetail with what Medicare is going to do with CED. Yeah, so thanks, Steve. Uh, so I'll be real quick. I mean, from a uh, post-marketing requirement, as we've said, we're working with urgency. We completely agree nine years is not what our intention is. We want to complete that much sooner. Um, so we've mobilized resources. We look forward to engaging with all stakeholders, of course, FDA, CMS, and others. Um, and But that's not the only source of information. So we're doing a number of other efforts that we'll be uh, sharing soon with regards to an ambitious research agenda to support further um, understanding um, at your helm. Um, and on the NCD, as we've said, um, and I hope people have heard, you, we were concerned about regional variability. We're delighted um, and have welcomed the opening of the NCD. Um, I really hope what Mark said doesn't come into fruition over the next nine months. Nine months for a condition like Alzheimer's is a long time. And I really hope local coverage decisions and policies there um, evolve quickly to allow some patients to gain access during this uh, interim period while we wait for the national decision. Um, and I think from precedent, it would be really unfortunate if that happened here for Alzheimer's disease. So I'm hopeful on that. I can say our engagements with uh, uh, health plans, we've had over 120 conversations with Max and various health plans. Those discussions, I believe, have been productive. And you know, we're encouraged by some of the questions. People are trying to understand. This is a complex area. This is the first treatment. They're trying to understand it quickly. We're five weeks in to its approval with a new label update last week. And so people are trying to understand that. So we stand ready to help engage, help them understand the information and data as we have. Okay, thank you. Um, folks on the policy roundtable, thank you so much. We're entering the last half hour of our meeting and I wanna offer you an opportunity to have a final um, statement. Um, we always ask people to make it one sentence. <laughs> um, I know that's very hard. But I want to invite you to either say the one thing you want everybody to have ringing in their ears as they leave this meeting, um, or it can be also a request that you think um, should be made of one of the key stakeholders at the table, um, or even those who aren't, um, something that would be most important to help the future of care for patients with Alzheimer's um, as good as it can be. So think about what you might want to say, and I'm going to let the patients go last in this round before we turn to final comments from the CTAF panel itself. But please, just one sentence, um, if you will. Can I start with the payers, Leslie? Can I start with you, please? Yep. Thank you. So, um, thank you for letting us be on the panel. And um, I think really, there's two things. Um, it's dynamic. I think everybody should really be ready for a lot of different changes as new information. And hopefully, we'll get more information. And the other thing, I know you said one, but um, accelerated approval. I think it um, this really gave a lot of people an idea of what accelerated approval means. And um, I think a lot of people are happy that it's right now being looked at um, by the FDA, what accelerated approval means. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Pat? Yeah, I, I'd ask that uh, being at the price is not to value, Chris, that we can somehow work out a, some kind of value-based purchasing agreement to try to get the price to value. Yeah, I mean, we, we would like to have patients have access to this medication, even though we've currently deemed that it's not medically necessary. We envision that you'll have evidence at some point to show that it works. Um, we're hopeful that that's the case. So we'd like to work with you um, to ensure a fair price. Okay, thanks very much. Um, Dr. Henderson. So I think the clinical need for um, something effective in Alzheimer's disease is, is very clear. Um, I think though that the case for a clinically meaningful effect for this particular medication has yet to be shown. Thank you very much. Dr. Kremen. Speak to more non-pharmacological um, aspects of clinical care, I would plead to CMS to recognize what it takes to be a provider for patients with dementia and uh, that we are not procedure-based, we're talking-based uh, procedures. It takes a lot of time and effort to take care of the patients and their caregivers, and we'd love some recognition of, of that effort. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, rounding uh, to, let me go to Chris, please, first. Chris. Thanks, Steve. And I just want to say thanks to the CTAF panel. Um, this has been the last two days, actually, for me with Steve, with Mark, and with a number of different experts in the area. 
Um, it's been phenomenal. Um, so I just appreciate the opportunity to be here on behalf of Biogen and Eastside to talk about this first kind treatment. Uh, my request, Steve, to you on the report is today you have a fantastic group assembled and there was a very uh, uh, you know, good discussion. There was also a discussion yesterday and I have to say it felt very different today. So it just seemed a little bit like we're lacking some of the balance from some of the conversation yesterday. And I don't disagree with um, you know, all perspectives should be heard here. And I think you've got a great group today, but I would hope that some of the perspectives from yesterday's meeting also would make it into the report. Um, and finally, uh, for the next Alzheimer's treatment, we've learned we need a five hour uh, policy panel. Uh, so that would be my recommendation. Five day, I think, yes. I hear you, thank you. Uh, Matthew. One sentence. Mark, there are wait, people. I Mark. Wait, I forgot Mark. Let me let the patients okay. go last. I'm gonna let the patients go last, and I completely forgot. Mark, Mark you're not a patient. So well, I, I definitely want to defer to, to to Matthew and and, and Laura, but um, on behalf of Medicare, since the Medicare coverage here is so important, please think about how to help out the program and and comment both in the short term on the NCD itself, and let's find a way. You heard from both Pat and Chris payer developer, they're interested in, in finding ways to pay for treatments like this that are accelerated where we have more questions on a basis other than volume of sales and in a way that's tied to the outcomes that patients actually get in their care models and practice. Time to move to that. Thank you. Good. Okay, Matthew. Yes, one sentence. Uh, there are people who will benefit from this drug, and we must eliminate the barriers um, to, uh, for them to access it. Matthew, you will always be invited back to a future policy roundtable, because I love one sentences that are <laughs> that tight. Thank you. Um, Laura. Okay, one sentence. First of all, thank you, everyone, because uh, I feel really... Um, a warm sense of people willing and eager to work together to find a good solution. So Chris, I respect your needs, needs of your company. I'm uh, in the accounting area of business, so I understand costs, but in the interest of furthering uh, this cause, please sharpen your pencil just a little bit more. Maybe we'll get you further in the long run. Thank you very much, Laura. Okay, um, it's gonna be virtual, but let me thank you uh, along with the rest of the CTAP panel for all the comments and the contributions of our policy roundtable. Again, many of whom have helped us throughout the course of this report um, and have engaged in a variety of different ways. Um, and so you guys really have been important and central in, in so many different ways, thank you. I wanna hand it back over to Rena to, to moderate the final round of comments from CTAF members themselves, and then I myself will have a short closing statement at the very end. Rena? Thank you, Steve, and thank you to everyone on our panel uh, for that really um, very spirited, helpful, um, deep discussion. Um, we're, we will now ask each CTAF member to turn your camera on um, and make a closing remark um, to summarize something that you are taking away from this meeting. Um, and in the spirit of what Steve has said, we will try to keep them very short. Um, I will start with my own comment, and this is a very, very big picture kind of global uh, view, which has mostly to do with um, an FDA related comment. Uh, the way I'm thinking about this is that we are a year and a half into a global pandemic with um, our best hope being in our vaccines. We have um, these incredible effective safe vaccines, but still a big portion of our country refusing to take them, many of whom offer the reason that, the, uh, that there's no FDA approval yet. And so I feel that we in the medical community are really put in a very awkward, um, challenging position when on the one hand, we are telling patients, please do not worry that something is not technically FDA approved yet, it's procedural, um, we think you should be vaccinated. And at the same time saying, there is something that is FDA approved here in this breakthrough department that we think is not really, or that many of us may think is not really um, worthy of that approval right now. So I, I feel that this whole topic is coming at a time when we really need our institutions like our FDA to be trustworthy 
and and we're dealing with a very skeptical public and that this has just made things a lot more confusing. Um, I will do my best to go around and I certainly wanna call on everyone. I'm gonna start with Ralph Brindis. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, my one sentence, I appreciate that the majority of patients eligible for this therapy are Medicare beneficiaries. As a past panel member of uh, MedCAC, I would hope CMS would convene a MedCAC meeting on this new drug to help advise CMS for its potential coverage and payment. If CNS was to go forward and cover a very select group of potential payment of patients for the drug, I hope that the NCD would include a CED as discussed, originally envisioned by Mark McClellan, that could help best inform all stakeholders as to the real world evidence of the safety and efficacy of this therapy. Thank you, Ralph. Tony Sowery. Hey, just turn off your mute. Um, am I on now? Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, it seems very likely that ISA will return to this study and this question and this disease in the near future. And let's all hope that when we do, there is more positive news and better results from the trials to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Hotch. To keep my comments short, I like to use haiku. Now I share my thoughts. Hope, help, and more time. What to pay for and how much. Look to the data. A plus in poetry. Um, Okay, next, let's take Say Lee. Um, I, I guess I would say that um, I think it is important that we don't lose sight of there are other proven therapies that help with Alzheimer's. Um, exercise has been shown to help even in moderate Alzheimer's and certainly helpful in mild uh, Alzheimer's. And with the prices that we're talking about, we could potentially give a personal trainer to anybody with MCI. And, uh, and I would argue that the magnitude of clinical benefit is substantially greater. And so for the companies that are asking for these sorts of sums, which I would argue is uh, ex extraordinarily high, uh, I would expect extraordinary evidence. And so far, I do not see that. Joanna Smith. I think I'm um, focused on the whole issue of asset allocation and looking at how do we affect healthcare globally, worldwide, and investing in this particular therapy at this particular point doesn't seem to meet those standards. Thank you, Joanna. Catherine Phillips. Wow, an incredible meeting. It was good to hear everybody. Um, now let's get busy and get more evidence. Elizabeth Murphy. Um, yeah, I, I think this is, of all the diseases we study, many are devastating, but this really seems to be more devastating in many ways and a huge burden on patients and caregivers. Um, and as we've seen before, when we're in this sort of situation, it's very hard for everyone. In this case, it seems FDA included to be very objective. It just makes it very difficult to do that. Um, but I wanted to disagree a little bit and say that I don't think something is always better than nothing. Um, and we've been so eloquently told how important hope is in this disease, but in the long run, I can't see how false hope might do more harm than good. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Jeff Klingman. Uh, we desperately need new treatments for this devastating disease, but we also desperately need to know if these treatments work. And surrogate markers such as amyloid reduction are absolutely not a substitute for real and significant clinical outcome improvement. Jeff, uh, Sanket Druva. Thanks. 
I hope that communication to patients and caregivers will include an acknowledgement about the underlying uncertainty of what the accelerated approval means in general, as well as the quality of evidence for aducanumab so that at the bedside in the clinics, informed clinical decision-making and informed consent are informed by the evidence, the scientific facts of safety and effectiveness. And I hope that in that case, that that will inspire enrollment in whatever sort of mandatory evidence generation continues forward and also prevents us from forgetting about other things that matter to patients and their loved ones with Alzheimer's disease, support, planning, coordination, care. Felicia, Felicia Cohen. Echoing what Elizabeth Murphy said, I think dementias are cruel disease that breed desperation. I hope we can help with more evidence. Our frontline physicians feeling pressure from family to help those families distinguish hope from false hope. Thank you. Um, Bob Collier. Thanks. Um, as a longtime patient advocate from the world of oncology, I just want to start off by suggesting that everybody who involves Alzheimer's in this space needs to quit telling everybody else that their disease is worse than all of the rest of them. That's just not, not true. This, this, this approval was based on amyloid plaque reduction, which was not the primary endpoint. Uh, I agree with Elizabeth. Anything that does something is better than nothing is really not the way to go in drug development. It's not what any of us really want in the end. And fundamentally, it's not true. That's exactly why we have uh, highly structured clinical trials. Ones like Biogen ran here and that are still listed on clinicaltrials.gov as terminated for futility. That's a criteria that was in the original protocol drafted by Biogen and approved by FDA. I, do, I fundamentally suggest that that's why there's such pushback from the advisory committee and everybody else. These are failed trials. Congratulations again to Biogen and everybody to come for apparently discovering that we can do ad hoc accelerated approval trials based on data we've already got that we may not have actually published yet and we can find coming into things. That's my little spiel right there. I support development of drugs. I support drugs for Alzheimer's. I know it as well as everybody else does, but this isn't the way to go. To the Alzheimer's Association, I would suggest that I would start to let, you haven't had a lot of experience with this and a whole lot of other patient organizations have had to start to deal with it. Spell out your officers, board members, and maybe employees conflicts of interest financially because it doesn't look good right now touting how little pharma money you get, but we don't know about the people involved. And additionally, in, in association with size point, this money is probably much better spent just, just giving it to Alzheimer's patients instead of fund, funding this drug. I think we ought to have that argument. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Annette. So I will, mine's two sentences, but um, so the day that um, the FDA announced the decision to approve aducanumab, I got about 100 emails within 10 minutes, colleagues who felt betrayed and were outraged um, that they went against the, the evidence and against the advice of their advisory panel. I was not at all surprised, probably one of the few, but I was certainly saddened because it, I wasn't surprised because it follows a worrisome pattern of the government to enact both um, decisions, policies, and laws that favor the profits of pharma over the needs of the American populace. Um, so as I mentioned before, my concern is really about this reverse Robin Hood. We're paying lip service that we want to, de to improve health equity, yet we're approving a drug that is incredibly unaffordable, is likely to do more harm than good on both an individual and a societal level. And I'll close by saying that my mother too has Alzheimer's. I'm one of her many caregivers. Thursday, when I get off this call, Thursday nights and Sundays are mine. Um, and I would not give this to her. And I'm approaching the age where she first became symptomatic and I would not take it if, um, even if it were covered. So um, I'd like the FDA to consider, really reconsider what rapid approval means and what flexible approval means. If they really care about the American populace, 
They would make it easier to get biosimilars on the market and easier to get drugs like rituximab for multiple sclerosis coverage. Um, a lesson learned there that we delayed access to highly effective therapy for 10 years because we, we placed the profits of pharma over the needs of patients. And that's it. So thank you guys. Thank you everyone for all your input, the you know, patient advocates in particular and Biogen for being patient, not easy to be in your shoes. Thank you. Okay, we have two more, Richard, Richard Seiden. Like many, if not most of the CTAF panel members, my family has been touched by Alzheimer's and dementia. So I fully understand and sympathize with the comments of the patients, caregivers and organizations. I am optimistic and hopeful that further research will yield better disease modifying drugs. In the meantime, I trust that clinicians will appropriately manage the expectations of patients and caregivers relative to Adjuhelm, and I do worry about false hope. And Anne, Anne Raldo, thank you for being our wrap up. Yeah, of course. So, um, you know, clearly Alzheimer's disease is very devastating. I too have a personal connection to Alzheimer's disease. I saw my um, grandmother as a child and as an early teenager deteriorate in front of my eyes. So, um, I, I know what it's like to um, have someone close to you that, that's affected by this terrible disease. Um, at the same time, I, or what's stuck in my mind from an intellectual level is that tornado diagram where, um, you know, what is, what has the most amount um, of, de um, of uh, model uh, dependency or what the model outcomes depends on is really treatment effect. Um, and I don't think that the data we have available at this point um, really answers the question of what that treatment effect is. Um, and so I think, you know, we need further study uh, for this drug in particular to um, hash that out. And I also would be very careful about um, you know, using a drug that potentially has more harm than good associated with it. Right now, we just don't know. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't think I skipped anyone, but if I did, please. I think you did. I think you got everybody. Okay, passing yeah. it back to you, Steve. Right. Uh, thank you, CTAF panel. As always, uh, you guys did an extraordinary job of uh, understanding the information, um, reading the evidence, um, bringing your own knowledge and perspectives to the table. It's a diverse group, but you guys shared your, your feelings and I just can't thank you enough. Um, so my last comments in some ways go back again to the sense of my, of my own mother, my father, um, and all, all the other people who've, who've brought forward their stories today. And again, I know others could have. We all understand how horrible this condition is and the need that we have for different approaches to it, not just drugs, but other broader approaches, but treatments, you know, pharmaceutical treatments would be fantastic. There's a dread to Alzheimer's disease and the scale of it across our, our, our society that just makes it, it, it makes it an outsized concern for all of us. And this to me is exactly when we face the greatest challenge of trying to wrestle with the hope of having something new, with the deep desire to do everything possible for our loved ones and ultimately for ourselves. Um, and to take any risk, to put, to, to throw caution to the wind, to take a chance. We all feel that and it's our greatest challenge to recognize that we have to balance that with understanding the, the need to also the hope of doing no harm. Um, patients who have Alzheimer's, we care for them in so many ways, some of them similar to the ways that we've always known them as, as, as people. And some ways we, they become much more vulnerable and we care for them and to do something that could hurt them, make them fall, make them get sicker. It, it's just, you know, it, it's something that we have to wrestle with. And so this tension inside of us is also such that we have to re remember that we're not just talking about the right to try something. We're also talking about this broader 
health system and society in which we're asking for other people to help pay for this, not just ourselves. So this is all means that, you know, we all have to look at this and, and really take on this challenge. And it gives us the opportunity to be our best selves. Our best selves means to not shy away from the difficulty. Um, but our best selves also means other things. I'm very, very impressed by the way that the physician societies here in the US are stepping up to talk about the evidence, to talk about the cost, what they see as the potential harms to patients. They don't see this as an easy situation, but they're wrestling with it, but they're coming forward and talking about it. The Alzheimer's Association and other patient groups, reasonable people can differ about the science um, and they are also engaging around the cost and the burden and the broader needs for patients and families. And that's important. Other people, the FDA needs to get its act together. In this kind of situation, more than any other, they need to show transparency. They need to show consistency and openness around their procedures. If they want to call amyloid a surrogate outcome, they can go through the process of doing that and not just trying to throw a Hail Mary at the last second. The process has been a very difficult one. And just that, mean, that alone means that the FDA needs to take a firm look at how it approaches these kinds of situations. Um, it, was, it was laudable that they, in a sense, admitted their mistake with the first label and narrowed it down. Um, they need to take a broad look at everything in their procedures and their approaches so that they can help us all meet this, this great challenge. And sometimes we wait. I mean, I was thinking again about the, uh, an earlier drug that we reviewed that Biogen made, um, a drug for spinal muscular atrophy. Um, and that patient group, this is a condition of children where they, many of them die within one to two years um, after birth. Um, others are left severely disabled and then die a short time after that in adolescence. Um, and that patient group waited. They did a randomized control trial process with Biogen. They came out with an A level of, of evidence. And it's, it's a sign that we can all work together to make sure that the evidence is there. But sometimes we wait until we get that evidence. And it's hard to wait, but we have to. Lastly, if we're going ahead and, and using and paying for a treatment like this, the other entity that obviously has an, a role, payers have a role, the manufacturer here has a role and a special opportunity to show best practice. Um, they have to price in a way that will not cause harm. If they had priced to what we considered and everybody can differ around the assumptions, we spent eight months, objective, conflict-free staff, talking to clinical experts, about a price of 5,600, one-tenth of the price they came out with. That would mean $1,000 out of the pocket of Medicare patients and not 11,000. A huge difference in our ability to make this treatment available and do it in a way that doesn't augment disparities and that sets a standard for the future. So that alternative universe, that kind of fantasy that I had, it's still possible because Biogen still has the ability to change its list price. It's not too late. And I would stand with the Alzheimer's Association, with all of the other physician groups that have spoken out on this. And I think um, for many Americans and say, Biogen, take this opportunity and standing with patients, um, they said that this price is unacceptable and should change. It's not too late. Biogen could do the right thing and I hope that they will consider it. So with that, I would like again to thank them for participating, all of the other participants, the patient representatives, um, all of you on CTAF, the ISA research staff, which did a spectacular job. And I'd like to invite all of us listening still in particular to know that we will be back to this topic as further evidence evolves, as future treatments are developed. And I hope that we can set a platform for a future in which we will have effective treatments that we all can afford and see as true, true transformative benefits for our healthcare system and our country. So be well, and I hope when we meet next, it will be in person and that we will have uh, other jobs at hand. Thank you all.